Let's see. Ah, good. We are recording. So, folks, uh, this is going to be a long one, but I will be pulling out the different sections as I go along. So, it's first, I think, worthwhile to observe. This is the prologue. prologue. It's first worthwhile to observe that the author of our textbook and I approach religion, religious studies in a very different way. Uh, on the one hand, I'm in one sense more specialized than he is, but in another sense, I'm more of a generalist. Let me explain. My specialty is in the area of law and religion, since I both have a Juris Doctor and a Master's in religion. Most of my publications to date have public focused on how different religions have impacted on our legal system and been impacted by our legal system. So uh, because we live in such a pluralistic, religiously pluralistic society, as a result, I end up knowing a fair amount of most of the major religions in the world. So now, um, as a result, when I read the text, I'm employing both legal reasoning and a world religions approach. Also, although I have a degree in philosophy, I suspect I have more of a focus on ancient schools of philosophy rather than our author, who I have seen more than once ascribing um, really ancient ideas to more 20th century philosophers. Um, now, my particular area of focus has been upon the ancient philosophers that focused on the notions of eudaimonia, which is the question of what is a good life well lived, and also what um, on ethics. I like both of these areas of philosophy because I think honestly that philosophy has gone down a bit of a rabbit hole in the last 20, 200 years by focusing a bit too much on epistemology, uh, how do we know what we know, and uh, metaphysics. Now, that's why in these announcements, I've been trying to supplement the text to address points our author seems to have looked in regards to uh, the many alternative perspectives on theism and world religion, as opposed to the much, much narrower and sometimes problematic one of the Abrahamic traditions, which our author seems to take as representative of all theisms. No, no, Abrahamic theism is actually a very narrow kind of theism as compared to the theism of other major religions in the world. Also, I feel obliged. Um, so, uh, uh, one sec. Ah, here we go. Lost my place. Sorry, folks. Also, I feel obliged to bring up issues of critical thinking. Uh, for example, the importance of about evaluating the number and quality of sources to evaluate the credibility of the works that we're engaging with. You see, as an attorney, I am using tools of legal reasoning to weigh and assess the validity of the arguments being presented. But also, as a scholar, I'm trying to model how to engage with scholarly works in a scholarly way. Long and short, it's not sufficient to really read and understand the text. Scholarship calls for active, critical, and independent thought. So as you read the assigned text and one hopes my announcements, I hope you will heed the advice that is attributed to Shakyamuni Buddha, both in reference to our author, but also I met in reference to my own announcements. Shakyamuni Buddha is put as having said, do not believe in anything simply because you have heard it. Do not believe in anything simply because it is spoken or rumored by many. Do not believe in anything because it is found written in your religious books or in the textbook. Um, do not believe in anything merely on the authority of your teachers or your elders. Um, do you not believe in traditions because they've been handed down by many generations? But after observation and analysis, when you find anything agrees with reason 
and is conducive to the good and benefits of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. Which is to say, folks, I have some thoughts to share on this chapter about miracles, which although I think has some strong points and I will be pointing those out, it goes a bit astray on a key point towards the end. But I think this is the prologue and that's already kind of long. So let's turn to announcement number one. And let me begin with a confession. Ah, this is an administrative matter. It only came to my attention last week that the edition of the textbook that I have is the third edition and apparently we're using the fourth edition. So I've been making uh, page references so that you could know what I was referring to in these other announcements um, because we're <laughs> dealing with, <coughs> with different editions. Therefore, I will, whenever possible, try to give you quotes from the relevant section to make it clear what I'm responding to. So, comments, observations, elaborations, and clarifications, part one. On page 122, our author, again, elides all theism with Abrahamic theism when he states that theistic religions generally stress the occurrence of miracles. Well, although we do find miracle narratives in Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and those are taken as being central to the beliefs, those belief systems, that's not typical of all or even most theisms. Confucianism, for example, and Taoism have few, if any, miracle narratives. Although there are one or two miracles in the traditional narrative of Shakyamuni Buddha, those aren't the point of the teaching. As per the quote I shared in the prologue, Buddhism focuses as much or more on orthopraxis, correct practice, as it does on orthodoxy. If you go to a Zen um, retreat center, the focus will be, are you doing the Zen meditation correctly? And then share what you experience in the process of doing that meditation. It's not a matter of reading the sutra and being able to quote it chapter and verse. Now, even religions with scriptures often treat them as literature rather than as fact. The Buddhist sutras, I don't think your average Buddhist would be terribly upset if they found out, for example, that the character of Vomokirti in the Vomokirti Sutra didn't exist. It's literature. It says something profound and true about the human experience. Uh, literaristic interpretations of sacred texts are indeed found in the Abrahamic traditions, but that much approach is much more prevalent in the more conservative sects of the Abrahamic traditions. Orthodox Judaism, Shiite Islam, Evangelical Christianity, and much less so in the more progressive and or mystical sects, progressive Christianity, Reformed Judaism, um, Sufi uh, Islam. On page 123, at least in my edition, the author says people today still believe in miracles. Now that might be true, but this would be a much stronger point if it was backed up. Um, is belief in miracles prevalent or is it marginal or is it somewhere in between? What is the percentage? Again, page 123, we find a quote. It is more difficult to believe in miracles than it once was. To accept modern science is to expect to find natural causes for most, most of the events occurring in nature. Now, this notion is sometimes called the God of the gaps. Uh, as the notion is that religion exists to explain the natural world. And the people that argue for the God of the gaps, well, the argument against the God of the gaps is that as our knowledge, range and depth of our knowledge has expanded, those gaps are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I've linked a video with Neil deGrasse Tyson, 
talking about this notion. Now, he is in a full and admitted agnostic. I think he's a little bit sarcastic, but I think he gives a good um, example of the problem with holding on to the God of the gaps to hold on to theism. Um, let me also add, however, I personally, I personally would object to the notion of the God of the gaps as the linchpin for religion because uh, it's reductive. It tries to reduce all of religion to one specific aspect. Religion serves many, many different functions. Originally, it did have a function of trying to explain the natural world. But as, if that function is no longer as relevant as it used to be, that doesn't mean per se that religion is done for. So let me go to section two, announcement to sub two. Now, to the good, I want to give our author credit for addressing David Hume. I might produce here, David Hume is one of my all time favorite philosophers. I think he did a pretty good job of res resolving the issues of epistemology. Um, but, you know, I think there are some points in this section to call out for clarification and elaboration. So on page 128 of my edition, we find a lengthy paragraph in which Hume sets out the parameters under which a miracle can be reasonably admitted to have occurred. Now, the basic standard that he sets out is that if you have many disinterested people affirming the same occurrence again and again and again, uh, at a certain point, um, he limits it to direct um, testimony at some point. Even David Hume will admit, yeah, seems to have occurred. Well, term of art here. In New Testament textual criticism, especially in the project to try to define the teachings of the historical Jesus, this notion is what we call the criterion of multiple attestation. Um, of course, as an attorney, I also have to point out the attorneys have been saying the same thing for hundreds of years, but we use one single word, corroboration. Huh? Yeah. I, I have uh, feet in both fields, law and religion, and sometimes I get impatient with religious studies when they come up with these big, complicated, multi-syllabic phrases to say something the law has boiled down to just a word or two. So can we let me give you an example of how the principle of multiple multiple attestation or cooperation plays out in the real world. Case in point, did you know that there was once within the last couple of centuries or so, a year without a summer? Yeah, I know. I was surprised to find this out myself. You think the cycle of the seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall, but in 1816, Europe and North America experienced the return of winter weather after an otherwise ordinary spring. At that time, many blamed divine intervention and punishment in the popular literature that we see that reports this event, there was also speculation, why is God punishing us? Well, folks, we now know that the real cause was the explosion of an Indonesian volcano, Mount Tambora. An ash cloud floated into the high atmosphere over North America and Europe and lowered global temperatures in the process. Now, ironically, we are still the beneficiaries of that. During that summer, and let me go to my share function and see if that will work. During the summer of 1816,
trying to use my PowerPoint here. Oh, here we go. During the summer of 1816, one of my images has disappeared. Ah, here we go. During the summer of 1816, the notorious poet, Lord Byron, who is this gent here, um, he was once promptly dubbed mad, bad, and dangerous to know. He was like the original bad boy. Um, he was hosting a house party near Lake Geneva with his mistress, Claire Claremont, and his friend, the poet Percy Shelley, and Percy Shelley's mistress, Mary Godwin, were at a nearby villa. Mary Godwin would later marry him, become Mary Shelley. Also in this retinue was John Polidori. That's this gentleman in the lower right-hand corner, who was Byron's personal assistant. Well, uh, physician. Well, to pass the time, uh, I pronounce it's out of order. I hate that. To pass the time, given the gloomy and raining weather, Byron proposed a contest. Each was to write a scary story and entertain each other. Mary Shelley, Mary Godwin at the time, wrote Frankenstein essentially creating the first science fiction novel in the process. John Polidori here, uh, he wrote a novel, not quite as commonly read anymore, but very influential. That novel was titled The Vampire, a story about a vampire clearly modeled on his friend over here, Lord Byron. Now, before this time, although there were folk stories about vampires, they were portrayed essentially as shambling corpses, think something closer to what we think of as zombies nowadays. Polidori effectively created the vampire as we know it today, a vampire as being eloquent, charismatic, and seductive. Such an unlikely story, don't you think, that a volcano in Indonesia would cause a year without a summer and spur the creation of two important works of literature. But there's the thing. We can confidently say not only that it occurred due to the copious multiple attestation, that phrase again, or corroborative accounts about, about both the weather phenomena in the first case and the numerous accounts of the writing contest in question by the people who were present and participated, which accounts almost entirely agreed with each other. We also know that the year with the summer was not a miraculous divine intervention punishment, even though it was perceived as such at the time, because of what we now understand about volcanology and climatology, both of which sciences did not exist at that time. This gap as per the God of Gaps, originally assumed to be divine punishment at the time, has been essentially closed by our subsequent learning. So, back to, I think I got ahead of, me, ahead of myself a bit here. Uh, I think when my notes get out of work. So I skipped over some material about John David Hume. Let me just talk a little bit about him. I mentioned he's one of my favorite philosophers. I like him because he is one of the fathers of empiricism. We know that our knowledge of the world is based on sense impressions. Such matters of fact are based on experience, a posteriori, and the truth is synthetic. The predicate is not contained in the subject. A bachelor is an unmarried male, while unmarried and male is implied in the subject. While for him, all truth is known after the fact via sense experience. He's credited as being one of the founders of empiricism, and empiricism holds that all true statements ultimately refer back to sensory experience. As such, David Hume's ideas help pave the way for experimental science 
as we have it today. So next section. Our author on page 131 raises the point that in the process of scientific discovery, exceptions do occur to supposed laws, which have sometimes led to the quote unquote laws of nature being revised. Although this is a valid point, I think the statement would be much stronger if our author had at least given us some examples of this. He hasn't, so let me have a go at supplementing that and give you a couple examples. The geocentric cosmology of Ptolemy made entire sense for most of human written history. We only had to know, standing on the ground, looking up at the sky, that you felt stable, but you could see the sky moving. Um, but then Copernicus came along and he observed that there were phenomena in the sky that were easily, more easily accounted for if you assumed that the earth rotates around in orbit of the sun rather than if you assume that the sun orbits around the earth. This again is Occam's razor or the principle of parsimony, what seemed to be a law of nature, that the sun revolves around the earth. So it becomes revised as more and more exceptions are discovered until finally the most parsimonious explanation is revealed that it's the other way around. Similarly, Going back to antiquity, from the works of Aristotle, it was just assumed that heavier objects fell faster than lighter ones. This was perceived as a law of nature. Everyone just knew that, that was the case. It took Galileo again um, to put this received wisdom to the test. He was perhaps one of our first true scientists. He wasn't content to just accept things as true on their face until he tested them. According to legend, he is said to have ascended a tall tower um, and dropped simultaneously a small cannonball and a large one. The expectation was that the larger cannonball will fall faster. But lo and behold, they landed at just about the same time. Well, Folks, this suggests to me another possible solution to the problem of miracles, so-called. One that our author, I don't think, really has given as much weight to as it should. Let me suggest this to you. Could it be that miracles are not divine intervention that breaks the law of nature? so much as an anomaly that occurs because there are laws of nature that OMG folks, we have not discovered yet. Those gaps get smaller and smaller and smaller. Maybe it's just a matter of time. <laughs> so maybe, just maybe, Instead of inquiring into why deity has visited us with such a punishment, again, if we, let's hypothesize that a major volcano goes off, we have another year without a summer, maybe instead of saying, why is God punishing us? Just maybe we should instead inquire whether a volcano has exploded somewhere in the world. Now, on the one hand, I have to admit, this is an argument by analogy, which our author has said are perforce weak. Uh, now, I must admit, I don't agree with that. Um, as an attorney in a system where analogies are drawn from precedents to resolve current issues, that's news to me. We've had our legal system for something like, you know, 800 years. And part of the reason why the Anglo-American common law system has proven 
to be so powerful is precisely because of the principle of stare decisis. If a decision was rendered correctly in one instance and you have analogous, analogous circumstances, then that decision should apply in another circumstance. The point remains, could the notion of miracles be as well accounted for by the uh, limitation and lacunae of human knowledge instead of going against Occam's razor, aka the principle of parsimony, and invoking an additional factor, a divine agency or force to account for phenomena which we do not currently understand. Doesn't make easy, more sense to say there's limits to current human knowledge than to say, oh, there's this whole other elaborate being out there that accounts for it. Finally, on pages 130 through 131, we find our author quotes another scholar asserting that the resurrection accounts in the gospels are at least indirect proof of the existence of miracles. There are two or three different issues with this assertion. At this point, I hate to have to point this out. I'm sorry, but our author is boldly stepping over the boundary of philosophy, which seeks to find truth solely or primarily through reason. And he's stepping into out and out specifically Christian theology and apologetics. Theology is circumscribed with a particular doctrinal religion. But the Abrahamic religions behind, beyond Christianity do not support the reality of the resurrection. Judaism denies the resurrection out, outright and in Islam. Jesus is referred to in the Quran and he's healed as being an important prophet, um, even perhaps even more important than Muhammad himself, peace be upon him as our Muslim friends say, whenever they invoke his name. Well, Islam holds that Allah assumed Jesus off the cross directly into the heavens, rather than, than allow such a good and just person to die in such a painful and humiliating fashion. Therefore, at this point, and for that paragraph, our author is solely relying on a belief that is prevalent in Christianity, but it's not accepted by any other religion in the world. Uh, relying on the Christian resurrection accounts as even indirect evidence of miracles is relying on revealed scriptures in one particular religion and thus cannot even be culpably described by vague terms such as our author often uses as Western theism, ah, but on philosophy. At that point, it's out and out theology. I mentioned the word apologetics. I probably should elaborate on that. Apologetics is a movement in some doctrinal religions, especially those that um, have the aspect of exclusivism. Uh, Christian apologetics set out with two goals. One, to prove that Christianity is superior to any other religion. And number two, to prove that the Christian beliefs and doctrines are correct. So to rely on the resurrection accounts um, as evidence of miracles is both to change the field of inquiry into theology instead of philosophy, um, and tacitly shade more than a little bit into apologetics. Now, superficially, when it comes to the resurrection accounts, uh, the elements of agreement between these uh, four accounts and the four gospels <coughs> might seem initially to toll the criterion of multiple attestation. Um, but that assumes one that they were um, recorded independently. However, as per the chart that I put in the print version of this um, announcement, but which I forgot to put in my PowerPoint, I'm afraid, 
uh, which I just realized just now. Uh, let me apply the technique that our author calls the GE Moorship. Uh, old school philosophy, we call that modus tollens. It goes back to Aristotle. Anyway, let's set forth a couple of axioms. An axiom is something that is meant to be acceptable as true on its face. So if, number one, if Jesus was resurrected, and if this was the turning point, the point of his entire mission, one, wouldn't you expect the account of such an ethical and definitive event to be largely internally consistent, like the accounts of the house party at the Villa Diodota that led to the writing of Frankenstein and the vampire? Um, also, wouldn't you expect his direct followers, the early Jewish Christians, who either personally experienced these events or heard accounts at no more than second or third hand, wouldn't you think that they would make the resurrection and the divinity of Jesus the center of their engagement with and following of Jesus? Well, to borrow a phrase that's all very, very common in Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica said contra. Number one, the counts are strikingly inconsistent. As you note in uh, the chart that I put on the print form of this announcement. Moreover, let me add that New Testament textual criticism point out that the resurrection account in the very first written gospel, the gospel Mark was a later addition the earlier manuscripts of Mark do not have a direct or explicit resurrection narrative. I have a link in the print version to an essay about uh, the issue, the problem with the resurrection account in the Gospel of Mark. Moreover, the earliest Jewish Christian community in Jerusalem, founded by his brother, James the Just, um, they were later dubbed either Ebionites and or Nazarenes. They, they revered Jesus as a profound moral teacher, but did not consider him either divine or as a messiah. As I quote from a source, which I have linked in the print version, Ebionites reject Paul and the doctrine of the virgin birth or divinity of Jesus, using only the Hebrew gospel of Matthew and are thus more extreme in their Judaism. They describe the Nazarenes more positively as those who accept Paul with caution and believe in some aspect of divinity of Jesus, even possibly the virgin birth, but they viewed him as the adopted son of God. This is adoptionism, a, which was an early issue in Christianity. When did Jesus become God? Some said that he was just a wisdom figure. Others, like the Ebionites, Nazarene said that he became transfigured into God uh, at the time of his uh, resurrection. <laughs> This ascription of divinity relationship seems to have been by all the, uh, by scholarly accounts, to, it seems to have been the innovation of the Apostle Paul, according to James Tambor's book, Paul and Jesus. I provided a link to that text on Amazon. I strongly recommend it. I read it only a few months ago. I'm still pondering a lot of the ideas. So, therefore, if these last two statements are accepted as correct, one, the resurrection accounts do not agree with each other in a substantial portion. In fact, there's some question as to whether or not a Mark 
the gospel Mark originally had a resurrection account. And number two, if the followers that were following in the oral tradition of the original teachings and, and deeds of Jesus um, were impressed by his uh, resurrection, why did they treat him primarily as a wisdom figure? Therefore, if these two statements are accepted as correct, then the first maxim is effectively refuted. Overall, I think that although our author has brought up some interesting points about the nature and implications of miracle accounts, which do raise worthwhile food for thought, his over reliance on the putative truth of a specific miracle account, one which is a lot less to use legal expression open and shut than is commonly assumed, undermines the credibility of a number of his other points. So engage with what he had to say, engage with what I have just said, but know that the proof, quote unquote, of the resurrection is still something about which, so to speak, to fall back on my background as a lawyer, the jury, is still out. I know this has been a lengthy announcement. That's why I broke it up in print into three or four or five sections. This is the video version. Please feel free to uh, email me. And if you have any thoughts, comments, or questions, ciao for now.